This is Revolution at Sea with John Curtis Perry. Part 3, A Second Oceanic Revolution. Episode 17, A Great Transformation. Now we go to Part 3, From Wood and Sail to Iron and Steam, A Second Oceanic Revolution. The first phase of oceanic revolution is what we've been looking at so far. It's identified with uh, exploration and discovery, the linkage of the two peripheries of the Eurasian landmass, the European Oceanic Rim and China, the bringing of the New World and Africa into the global community, the establishing of a global trading system, the first global religion, the first global languages. Europeans build a global network of trading enclaves and colonize major parts of the Americas. The Industrial Revolution beginning around 1780 sees massive exploitation of inanimate fossil energy for production, manufacturing, and for the dispatch of information, telegraphy. New machinery captures steam for propulsive power at sea as well as on land and prompts the electric telegraph with a subsurface oceanic cable springing from it. Electricity applied to communications truly divorces it from the pace of transportation for the first time in history. Steam and electricity thus provide the instruments for a second phase of oceanic revolution, widening the gap enormously between the Atlantic fringe and the rest of the world, those who have the machine and those who do not. Oceanic Revolution and Industrial Revolution were both of European initiative. This served to inflate a continuing and growing sense of self-importance, Eurocentrism. And these great changes led to an enormous shift in balances of power. Few can now dominate many. On land, The rapid-fire Gatling gun, predecessor of the machine gun, inspired poet Hilaire Belloc. He wrote, Whatever happens, we have got the Gatling gun, and they have not. This weapon could fire 500 rounds per minute, 50 times faster than the best available rifle. On ships, guns of all kinds carried power into new dimensions with quick-firing guns, and the iron-hulled, screw-propelled, steam-powered gunboat with its shallow draft furnished a prime weapon for exploiting riverine systems for deep penetration into hitherto closed interiors in Africa and Asia, be it the Zambezi or the Yangtze. Warships gained a new brown water capability. A prime example would emerge in the first opium war in China, 1839-1842, in which the British gunboat Nemesis fighting against Chinese junks was described as a black snake among rabbits. Independent of wind and current with her shallow draft, she could slither over sandbanks and close in on her hapless, becalmed, sail-powered targets. In war, steam power carried both strategic and tactical implications. Sail bore strategic advantage with no fuel dependency, 
but tactical disadvantage. Ships moved at the mercy of winds, tides, and currents. Steam bore tactical advantage, but strategic disadvantage carrying a new dependency, fuel. The steamship was tied to a network of coaling stations to service these needs. Britain held advantages in building an empire. It already held scattered territories, like the Portuguese earlier, but more so. Many of these, like Malta or Aden, did not develop into important modern commercial centers. Some were mere outposts, imperial confetti, but others, notably Singapore and Hong Kong, even as colonies gained strong identities, becoming virtual maritime city-states, cosmopolitan urban ports, using English as a lingua franca, all formed an imperial network, an avenue of empire. Thus, bases provided a prime strategic resource. In addition, Britain possessed ample coal, the first nation to extract coal intensively. The pace of the Industrial Revolution was initially slow, but it accelerates, growing more by drift than by plan. Machines evolve from informal knowledge, from tactile and muscular experience as well as the visual. British engineering would incorporate the thrust. The impact was truly revolutionary both for the ocean as avenue and as arena, but as source, too. Steam propulsion made fishing much easier. Humankind begins to deplete fish supplies. That slide towards the world of jellyfish and slime, which some experts now predict may face us. But few people were yet aware of the growing human impact on the ocean and its ultimate fragility. For the sailor, the change from sail to steam meant that seamanship came to seem less important than engineering. Those who had invested a lifetime mastering the traditional and arcane arts of seamanship felt threatened by the change and were instinctively hostile toward what some scornfully called the tin kettle. Old-timers grumbled that iron ships and wooden men were replacing wooden ships and iron men. The engine lowered dependence of man upon nature, making the connection less intimate. Steam power would dramatically alter the perception and nature of sea travel from dangerous, protracted, and uncomfortable to relatively safe, predictable in duration, and potentially even luxurious. Steam power enables the North Atlantic world to exploit the globe in a new fashion, to gain control over an immensity of continental space in addition to oceanic space, because it enabled exploitation of that saltwater realm in a new way, giving easy access inshore as well as on the high seas, brown water as well as blue. Explorations are now more inland than maritime. Europeans build territorial empires in Eurasia and Africa, economic empires in the Americas, all linked to the homeland by the world ocean. This technological revolution from sail to steam, plus the new exploitation of the electric pulse, form a major punctuation mark in the flow of maritime history and of modern international history with which pelagic history coincides in which that history does so much to create. Steam 
iron, and machine-made cloth define the new industrial age as one of British leadership. We may conveniently establish a time span, 1815 to 1914, which divides itself conveniently into two parts, the first being 1815 until 1869, that Annus Mirabilis, year of wonders, Suez and Promontory Point, the canal and the North American Transcontinental Railroad. Having defeated the French, Britain enters the 19th century, 1815, preeminent at sea. Historian Christopher Lloyd declares that British sea power exercised a wider influence than had ever been seen in the history of maritime empires, commanding the world through saltwater geography. This was not just warships, but merchant ships, too. One-third of the world's fleet flew the British flag. No consensus arose of what to do with the unfolding new technologies. These are always confusing. But the advantages were immediately perceivable. For example, in the 1840s, the first transatlantic steam packets were introduced, offering predictability not only of departure but arrival. Navies in the period 1815-1869 were a hodgepodge of types, old and new. In the 1840s, Britain's Royal Navy continued to build sail-powered ships of the line. Admirals clung to the comfort of what they knew. They used steam grudgingly, but found steamships useful to carry dispatches, or to tow sailing ships into action. In 1827, Navarino in the Mediterranean would be the last great battle of sailing ships, the British, French, and Russians against the Turks and Egyptians. In a sense, a replay of Lepanto, Christians against Muslims. In that last great battle of ore-powered galleys. In the early 1800s, we see a progression in hull construction from wood to metal and in propulsion from paddle wheel and auxiliary sail to screw power from the bottom of the ship. Navies had rapidly learned that the paddle wheel blocked broadside fire, whereas the screw did not. With guns firing exploding shells instead of solid shot, and with rifled barrels providing greater accuracy, guns were far more effective. Armor plate introduces a contest between gun and armor, the offensive versus the defensive. Britain, France, and Russia, a poor third, were now the major powers at sea, and the British view those two as major strategic rivals because each could menace India, France by sea, Russia by land. The Royal Navy needed to be able to outfight France and Russia too, if necessary. It also saw a mission to advance science by charting the waters and to police the oceans a moral force, upholding ethics and law, at least as the British defined them, hunting slavers in the Atlantic, harrying pirates in the Arabian Sea. But the Navy could also be used to support a morally indefensible act. Crass commercial interests instituted the opium war fought against the Chinese. Great Britain, thanks to dominating the ocean, became the world's first hyperpower, facing no real challengers, even within Europe or abroad. 
This became a prime fact of 19th century international affairs in the first half of that century. Incredible, is it not? A small island in the North Sea, accounting for one half of the world's pig iron production in 1870, and three quarters of the iron steel products on the world market. These were, of course, then the major indices of economic power. Coal-fueled manufacturing, and Britain was described as almost made of coal and surrounded by fish. By 1913, one-third of the world's coal experts came from South Wales. Welsh Cardiff, an anthracite, was prized for its high caloric content. Admirals loved it for its efficiency, and, burning with thin smoke, it aided concealment. But coal was dug at high social cost. One million Britons, men, women, children, worked underground in a terrible environment, dirty, dangerous, and hot. Some men even worked naked. Smoke from burning coal blanketed London skies. Steam power was first used to pump water out of coal mines, then applied to traction and steam. It becomes the engine of Britain's commercial industrial success. The pulse of economic life and the wealth it generated was derived from the power of steam. There grew a widespread perception of Great Britain as mistress of the seas, policeman of the world, with the Royal Navy its truncheon, paymaster of the Allies, with an immense power to borrow and disperse, and workshop of the world, the Midlands being analogous to today's China's Pearl River Delta or Yangtze Valley. Britain was the biggest manufacturer, the biggest exporter, the biggest investor, the biggest carrier that the world had ever known. And after 1865 and the collapse of the USA as a commercial maritime power, the British merchant marine was larger than all the chief rivals combined. With imports, the emphasis changes from cane sugar or bullion, spices or fine cottons, to raw cotton, phosphates, copper and tin, vegetable oils, sisal, jute, materials heading to factories. The British were increasingly dependent on food imports, wheat for the daily loaf, and the staples of the hearty cooked breakfast, one of the notable achievements of British cuisine, with bacon, bangers, and grilled kidneys. The British breakfast sets Britain apart from the continent, especially the French. Hogarth's Gin Lane may have faded as an image of lower-class urban life, but the poor lived on bread, margarine, tea, and sugar. To get a sense of this, read George Orwell's Keep the Aspidistra Flying. Britain made London the world metropolis, the world's greatest seaport, the world's clearinghouse. Just as Lancashire dominated cotton textiles, London dominated the money market. It retains much of this into the 21st century, largely because of the heritage of its oceanic past. But without ships, how long can London remain the global maritime capital, some ask? Canary Wharf, home to financial services, has never seen a ship. 
Traditionally, London was safe, unlike Amsterdam, even from the sound of gunfire. Refugees came from the continent, drawn by a stable polity and opportunity for economic betterment. The city, so-called, downtown London, becomes the most cosmopolitan element in British society. Rothschild, Hambro, Baring, Schroeder are not traditional British names. London excels as the global center of banking, insurance, Lloyd's, the world's largest marine insurer, shipping, ship brokerage, and communications. In the 19th century, it was telegraphy and undersea cables. British power rested ultimately on command of information flows. A new submarine cable network functioned as the brain and nerves of the organism. The British were the first to construct a global maritime telegraph system, which begins in 1851, spanning the Channel. It was centered on London and based on a strategic network of cable stations, forming a a wired world flying the Union Jack. British capital financed the cable industry. British factories made the cables. British ships surveyed the routes. British ships laid the cable, and Britons owned the cable. Britain was the first polity to create a global telecommunications empire, with communications operating faster than transportation and this became a primary sinew of British power. Information flows are largely unseen, not like a gunboat, a spinning mill, or an iron foundry, but an invisible force penetrating banks, offices, military headquarters, reaching into the foreign offices of rival nations, carrying their commercial and diplomatic secrets, secret to everyone but those concerned, and the all-hearing ears of the British cables. British knowledge and British strategic reach ensured that if wanted, the cables of any power, hostile or otherwise, could, if necessary, be tapped, cut, and spliced into British networks. Historian Daniel Hedrick observes that so tight was Britain's grip on world communications that it could not only block or read at will the most secret messages of its enemies, it could even use that information without revealing its sources. Never before in history had communications power been so concentrated, and so effective. This, of course, pales beside the USA today with the NSA as a key instrument of our national security state. In the early 20th century, Americans challenged wire with wireless radio, which could not be so easily controlled geographically. Radio was the first use of cyberspace. The U.S. Navy becomes obsessed with the need to break free from British networks, arguing that the British were reading everything, whether in code or not. This was touted as the reason for the poor performance of American commercial interests battling British competition. British control of the flow of the news also provided a propaganda opportunity, the ability to manipulate public opinion. No other nation could compete with Britain in the realm of cables, the nodes and fixed routes of the wired systems. British dominance lasted as long as the wired system retained its preeminence. And perhaps information technology is the most important technology of all, as we are being reminded today.
We hope that all of you on board will join us next time for episode 18, an exploration of a new maritime empire, one that Britons created in the 19th century. Revolution at Sea is written and spoken by John Curtis Perry, with additional voicing by Jamie Rosenberg. Recording by 1623 Studios, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Production and distribution by Albert Buichardet-Ferret. Goodbye until next time. <laughs>